Italian art between the 1480s and the 1520s is considered the High Renaissance. This term simply means that by this point in time we had reached a high point and that the period is the pinnacle of Renaissance achievement. High Renaissance art is characterized by a sense of gravity and decorum, a complex but ordered relationship of individual parts to the whole, and the emulation of the principles seen in ancient classical art. High Renaissance art seeks to fuse the real and the ideal and to create a balanced synthesis of classical ideal and the lifelike reproduction of nature based on observation and advanced philosophical studies and ideas about beauty and art. There were three leading artists in Italy during this time. Uh, these are Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, and Michelangelo. Leonardo da Vinci was the epitome of a Renaissance man. He loved math and engineering and the natural world. He was a painter, an architect, an engineer, a scientist, an inventor, and a map maker, and even more. He studied anatomy and did drawings to enhance his portrayals of the human body. He truly thought the best way to study the body was from the inside out, and by his death, he claimed to have dissected over 30 corpses in his pursuit of knowledge. Da Vinci was the first artist to accurately depict the human spine, but he also made thousands of other sketches of various aspects of human anatomy. In April 1483, da Vinci contracted with the Confraternity of the Immaculate Conception to paint an altarpiece for their chapel in the church of San Franciscan Grande in Milan. The painting is now known as the Virgin of the Rocks, and this is actually one of two existing versions today. This composition is complex yet unified. He depicts the virgin and child with angels and incorporates a young John the Baptist to balance the composition and creates a stable triangular figural arrangement. And now this arrangement will become quite standard in the High Renaissance, especially in painting. The figures are sort of positioned against this highly detailed landscape. Um, and to emphasize the figures, da Vinci has sort of spotlighted them using a technique called chiaroscuro. Now, chiaroscuro is from the Italian words chiaro, meaning light, and oscuro, meaning dark. And this technique involves using the high contrast of light and shadow to model three-dimensional forms, which is something that we've seen artists doing already, but that didn't really become a standard technique until the High Renaissance. Now, this painting depicts an early example of a specific variation of chiaroscuro uh, that was developed by da Vinci called sfumato, which means smoky. Um, da Vinci used subtle, almost imperceptible transitions between light and shadow and between colors, sort of allowing tones and colors to fade into one another and really soften their forms. And then this technique has been further enhanced by the yellowing of the thick layer of varnish over the top of the paint. Da Vinci painted his famous Last Supper on the wall of the dining hall at the monastery of Santa Maria de Grazzi in Milan between 1495 and 1498. Um, in this careful stage-like composition, da Vinci seemingly extends the dining hall with this fictitious space that's characterized by this coffered ceiling and four pairs of tapestries along the walls. Jesus and his disciples are arranged at a long table which runs parallel to the picture plane. The space converges along the diagonals of the tapestries um, towards the vanishing point that is um, directly behind Jesus' Jesus's head. Excuse me. Um, so again, the artist has sort of made him the visual and symbolic center point of the composition. Um, now, Christ's body forms a stable pyramid, and then he's flanked by his 12 disciples with groups of three um, on either side. So we have three, 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 and three. Um, 
Now, the scene is meant to capture the individual reactions of the disciples as Jesus announces that one of them will soon betray him. Um, So in the first group to Christ's right, we see a young John the Evangelist, an older Peter, and then here we also have Judas, which is the disciple that will betray Jesus. And if you notice, he's clutching this bag of money kind of close to his body. So he's presumably already been be- been paid for his betrayal. And then his face is kind of largely in shadow here. Um, the the grouping of these three figures is rather interesting because Judas is the one who will set the sacrifice of Christ into motion. Uh, Peter will take up authority over the church after Christ's death. And then John will foretell the second coming and the last judgment of Christ. Um, so the careful geometry, the convergence of the perspective lines, the stability of the pyramidal forms, and Jesus's calm demeanor at the mathematical center of this composition all sort of work together to reinforce a sense of gravity, balance, and order. The clarity and the stability of the work truly epitomize the high Renaissance style. However, Leonardo da Vinci desired to mimic the freedom and flexibility of oil paint on a wooden panel. And so here he experimented with mixing oil and tempera paints and applying them to a thin layer of dry plaster. The results, however, were quite disastrous and the work began to deteriorate very quickly with pieces flaking off even during da Vinci's lifetime. Um, And then later, the monks cut a hole into the wall to create a doorway and removed a large chunk of the already quite badly damaged painting. Raphael was a native of Urbino who moved to Florence in 1505 after studying with Perugino. He quickly made a name for himself by creating small images of the virgin and child that were commonly displayed in domestic spaces, particularly because Mary, with her beautiful yet modest appearance and calm demeanor, was seen as the ideal model for the Renaissance woman. Here we have two such works. We have Madonna of the Meadows on the left and Madonna of the Goldfinch on the right. In both, Raphael has employed that stable, pyramidal, figural composition here to achieve this sense of balance and unity. Mary serves as the apex of the triangle, um, while the infant Jesus and his cousin John the Baptist serve as the corner points and create the base. Um, On the left here in Madonna of the Meadows, um, both infants grasp this long slender staff that has a cross at the top. And so that actually illustrates kind of the diagonal side of our um, triangle here. The figures in both compositions are voluminous and weighty, and they really seem to truly occupy the surrounding space. Raphael has also incorporated chiaroscuro and slight sfumato, as well as atmospheric perspective to create this illusionistic space. Um, Again, in both compositions, Mary wears blue and red. The blue might symbolize her purity and her goodness, or maybe even her sort of royal status, while the red can be seen as a symbol of her motherly love and the blood of Christ. The figures still sport halos, but instead of the solid gold discs that we've seen in the past, we now have these uh, very thin golden ovals that sort of respond to the positions of the figures and that are really barely perceptible. Um, Also, in both compositions, Mary sort of gazes affectionately down at the infants while they interact. Um, On the right here, we have John the Baptist who holds this small bird, um, and Christ sort of reaches out to pet the bird's head. Um, So this is a goldfinch, and according to the traditional story, when Christ was crucified on the cross, a goldfinch flew down and tried to pluck some seeds from the crown of thorns on Christ's head. In the process, the bird got some of Christ's blood splashed on its face, and this gave the goldfinch its distinctive red coloration. So the inclusion of the bird here 
sort of foreshadows the events of the Passion of Christ and this intense eye contact that's happening between Jesus and John sort of implies that they both know um, what will happen in the future. In 1508, Raphael was commissioned to paint a series of frescoes on the walls of Pope Julius II's private library and study in Rome. Um, he painted the four branches of knowledge as they were conceived in the 16th century, religion, philosophy, poetry, and law. Now, the most influential of these frescoes is the philosophy fresco titled The School of Athens, which was painted in about 1510, 15, and 11. And it's this fresco on the wall in the back here. Um, so here we have the School of Athens. Um, and so using linear perspective and chiaroscuro, Raphael has really created this large multi-figured composition that depicts the scholars, mathematicians, philosophers, and other great thinkers of antiquity. Um, and so these are the figures to which the ideals of the Renaissance could be traced back to. Um, so along the wall here he's created this fictitious space using three barrel vaults that recede into space and frame this huge interior now the grandeur of the architecture is really meant to reflect the importance of the figures within the scene uh, at the center here we have the greek philosophers plato um, on the left with the long white beard and the purple and red robes and then we have his student aristotle on the right um, with the shorter brown hair and beard and then the blue and brown robes um, and then they stand sort of to either side of the vanishing point which sort of sits um, behind them in the sky here and so they're sort of silhouetted by the sky and framed by these uh, rounded uh, barrel vaults. Now to either side of Plato and Aristotle we have these groups of figures. Um, these are mathematicians, naturalists, astronomers, geographers, and other philo philosopher <laughs> and other uh, philosophers, excuse me, who are debating and demonstrating their theories to one another. The scene is really flooded with clear, even lighting, and it's truly activated by the lively gestures and energy of the characters. Um, on page 655 in your textbook, you can see a breakdown of this cast of characters further, um, and so I would definitely check that out. But overall, there's a lot going on within this scene. However, it's cohesive and balanced, and it really demonstrates the dynamic unity that characterized the High Renaissance. Michelangelo was born in Caprice, but he grew up in Florence, the artistic center of the early Renaissance. He was a painter and an architect, but in his heart of hearts, he was a sculptor. He envisioned his sculptures as already existing within the blocks of marble, which he chose very carefully, and he worked in a subtractive method in an effort to free them. So here we have a work that has long been considered non finito or unfinished. Um, it's thought that this was either a simple figure study or it was a figure meant for the tomb of Pope Julius II, a project that Michelangelo never finished. Regardless, we have this powerfully dynamic figure, and although we can't see the full body, we do have this evident contraposto stance with the um, extended kind of active left leg and then the relaxed leg bent at the knee here. And then we have the reversal of that pattern in the arms with um, the left arm kind of bent and raised while the right arm seems to um, just sort of dangle straight down to the side here. There's really this sense of motion created in the sort of S curve of the body here um, and in the way that the head really cranes backwards. Um, note too the difference in textures. We have this very smooth uh, sculpted skin versus the rough sort of chisel marks on the stone surrounding it. Um, these textures really seem to heighten the existing sense of dramatic emotion that really implies that the figure is sort of actively struggling to free himself from the stone. In fact, some have argued that Michelangelo deliberately left this unfinished as a sort of allegory for the human condition. 
Michelangelo's major early work was his Pietà, commissioned in about 1500 as a tomb monument for St. Peter's Basilica. The theme of the Pietà, in which the Virgin supports and mourns the dead Christ in her lap, was not very popular in Italy at this time, so this is somewhat unusual. Um, Michelangelo depicts the Virgin Mary as beautiful and young, with a sweet, calm expression of grief on her face that really underscores this tender human moment and distracts the viewer from some inconsistencies of scale. So while their heads are roughly the same size, Mary's body is immense in comparison to Christ's. Um, her seated form really sort of spreads out to support the almost horizontal curve of Christ's adult body in her lap. If Mary were to stand up, she would be nearly eight feet tall, but Michelangelo has really disguised her immensity in the deep folds of the draping fabric here, which also emphasize his technical skill and create this interesting interplay of light and shadow across the form. Christ's correct proportions, the naturalistic details, and the sweet emotionality of the figures and kind of their interaction really make us overlook the distortion of Mary's size. Now, Michelangelo's most famous work is the nearly 17 foot tall marble David, which was commissioned in 1501 to go on the roof line of the Florence Cathedral. But when it was finished in 1504, it was so well received that the city council chose to place it in the principal city square next to the Florentine seat of government instead as a symbol of the defense of civil liberties within the Republic of Florence. This monumental figure really conforms to the classical ideal of the heroic athletic male nude. Although the heavily furrowed brow and the intense gaze portray a level of emotion and concentration that were entirely new. So where Donatello depicted David in his moment of victory, Michelangelo chose to pose David staring off into the distance in this intense psychological or contemplative state of preparation. Um, he holds his slingshot over his shoulder and then he has his rock in his other hand and again he stares out in the distance as if he's looking at um, his enemy Goliath and thinking about how the battle is about to go. So here are a few um, close-up images to show you some of the details. Again, notice how sort of closely knit his eyebrows are and how intense the eyes are as well, and how that sort of creates this heightened sense of determination and concentration in the expression here. Um, you can also see just the incredible attention to detail given in this close-up of the hand that holds the rock um, with the veins and kind of the wrinkles of the skin. Um, so Michelangelo's David truly personifies the classical ideal of balance between physical strength and intellect and the demonstration of reserved, controlled emotions. Um, and so here's an image just to really give you an accurate sense of scale. Um, we have this museum worker cleaning the sculpture. Um, and so again, this was originally meant for the roof line of the Florence Cathedral. So the huge size was probably in part due to its intended location. However, the monumentality may also speak to the sculpture's intention as a symbol of the relatively new Republican status of Florence after the Medici family oligarch was ousted in the 1490s. In 1505, Pope Julius II arranged for Michelangelo to travel to Rome to work on Julius's tomb. However, two years later, Julius ordered him to begin work on painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling instead. While Michelangelo considered himself a sculptor and didn't particularly want the job, Pope Julius insisted, so Michelangelo abandoned the tomb and set to work on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which measures 45 feet wide by 128 feet long. 
To complete these frescoes, he had to build and stand on a special scaffolding in order to paint the ceiling that was just inches above his head. But despite his misery, the results established a new, powerful style in Renaissance painting. Um, Michelangelo's design includes trompe l'oeil or illusionistic architecture, um, pedestals, pillars, pilasters and cornices, all of which sort of form a grid that divides the surface of the ceiling into individual spaces um, for individual scenes. So in the center, we have nine large scenes that depict um, various moments from the book of Genesis. Uh, beginning at the altar wall, we have God dividing the light from the darkness during the period of creation, God creating the sun and planets, dividing the water from the earth, God's creation of Adam and Eve fall right about in the middle. Um, and then we have Adam and Eve being tempted and expelled from heaven, or excuse me, expelled from Eden. Um, then we have Noah and his family making a sacrifice. Um, we have the great flood, and we have Noah's drunkenness and disgrace after the flood. Um, along the sides, uh, Michelangelo has depicted these Old Testament prophets and sibyls or seers from the classical era who um, foretold the coming of Christ. And then in the corners, we have other Old Testament scenes. Um, and then in these triangular spaces and in these semicircle spaces, which are above windows, um, Michelangelo has included depictions of Jesus's ancestors. The most well-known of the scenes from the Sistine Chapel ceiling is probably the creation of Adam. Um, so this is a pretty large scene. It's about 12 feet by 44 feet. And so in it, Michelangelo has depicted the moment in which God charges his newly created Adam with the spark of life. Um, so Adam's heroic figure uh, sort of mirrors that of God, whose image he has been created in. Um, but Adam sort of stretches out, relaxes um, on this hillside. He reaches his arm out towards God and also stares rather intensely towards God. Um, we have this tension being created in the space between their fingers. Um, we can almost feel that spark of life being transferred from, from God's finger to Adam's. Um, and then from behind God on the opposite side, kind of out from under his other arm, we have this heroic female figure who's sort of peeking around. Um, so this is Eve prior to her creation, and she's trying to get a glimpse of Adam um, sort of ahead of time here. Um, here's another scene. This is the downfall of man and the expulsion of Adam and Eve from Eden. So again, both Adam and Eve um, have these heroic kind of muscular figures. Uh, the muscles in this scene are almost overly exaggerated, actually, um, almost comically exaggerated in, in some ways here. Um, but on the left, we have Adam and Eve taking the fruit from this sort of serpent demon hybrid creature who's wrapped around the tree of knowledge um, and then on the right we have this angel who expels them from paradise for their sins um, which this scene on the right might look a bit familiar to you um, it's it's very similar to Masaccio's expulsion of adam and eve uh, from the brancacci chapel which you know, Michelangelo, as a child growing up in Florence, it's quite conceivable that he would have been familiar with Masaccio's frescoes. Um, but I think it's interesting to place these side by side and sort of um, compare how the, the figures and the anatomy are depicted and how kind of the emotions are depicted as well. Um, you can also really see the progression in the technique of foreshortening here in the angel. Um, I threw this image in to discuss Michelangelo's interesting fresco techniques. Um, so this is one of the sibyls. This is a Libyan sibyl or a seer um, from the classical era who would have um, sort of foretold 
the birth of Christ and his passion and, and the full story. Um, but I, I put this in here to discuss how Michelangelo attempted to prevent the lines of his Gionata from becoming visible over time. Um, he, again, was very probably familiar with um, the frescoes by Masaccio at the Brancacci Chapel, and it's possible that those those seams were already starting to show. And so Michelangelo has really just, excuse me, tried to disguise the edges of those um, sections in areas of shadow or where colors were transitioning so that even after time has passed, you won't be able to see the lines. Um, for example, in this particular scene, he would have um, only plastered an area of about the size of the leg here, kind of from the knee down the calf and down to the point of the foot. This was probably one giornata. And so he's hidden the seams or the, the line between the sections within the areas of shadow, kind of the areas where the colors are transitioning into um, darker values and things so that they won't become visible after the colors have started to fade a bit. So beginning in the mid 1400s with Pope Nicholas V, we really started to see this desire to preserve ancient Roman monuments, to repair early Christian buildings, and to design new works of architecture in the classical Roman style. Now, Julius II, who was elected as Pope in 1503, commissioned several artists to carry out his vision of a revitalized Rome as the center of a new Christian architecture, inspired by the achievements of their 15th century predecessors and by the monuments of classical antiquity. Donato Bramante was born in northern Italy near Urbino, and he initially trained as a painter before becoming an architect. He worked in Milan near Leonardo da Vinci in the 1480s and 90s, and in 1499 he settled in Rome. In 1502, Spanish Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand commissioned Bramante to build a small shrine on the site of St. Peter's crucifixion. According to the story, St. Peter was set to be martyred, and his martyrs were going to crucify him, but Peter believed himself unworthy to die in the same fashion as Christ, and so he asked if he could be crucified upside down, and his martyrs complied. Um, so the small building here, known as Il Tempietto, or the Little Temple, utilizes a round plan in reference to early Christian mausolea or burial chambers. The circle is also meant to symbolize the cycle of death and resurrection and to remind the viewer of Rome's historical importance in the establishment of the Western Catholic Church. The exterior of the structure includes a stepped stylobate or this continuous stepped base um, which supports a circular colonnade or this row of columns. Um, a colonnade is a row of columns that creates sort of a, a hallway or a porch. Um, and in this case, it is a circular colonnade that encircles the central uh, dome, or excuse me, the central drum, which is topped by um, the dome here. Uh, the focus of the structure is all very central. Um, the exterior also features these Tuscan columns. Tuscan columns are sort of a Doric Roman variant that are not fluted and that are very solid. Um, and then the frieze along the top of the columns here includes triglyphs and metopes, which are from the Doric order of Greek architecture, um, but they're also inscribed with papal symbols. Um, and then if you can see kind of through the colonnade to the walls of the drum there, we also have pilasters that uh, line up with the encircling columns to really maximize the radial quality and create this sense of rhythm. And so the whole structure is quite simple and precise, and it emphasizes ideal proportions, symmetry, and balance, and ultimately it sort of creates this sense of monumentality and grandeur despite its small size. Um, and here's the interior. Again, you can really pick up on the classical inspiration here. We have the Tuscan pilasters that 
have sort of been incorporated again. We have the continuous frieze um, with the triglyphs and the metapes. We have the arches of the windows and kind of these niches um, where these sculptures are resting. Um, and again, with the repetition of the geometric shapes and the emphasis on symmetry. Um, also here in the floor, kind of in front of the altar, um, I believe in the in the center of the floor, you can see this hole in the ground, which is meant to mark the place where Peter's cross uh, would have been placed. So at the age of 60, Bramante was commissioned by Pope Julius II to redesign St. Peter's Basilica. So the old St. Peter's Basilica had originally been built on the site of St. Peter's tomb by Constantine in the fourth century. By Bramante's time, that structure was in almost total disrepair. And so the ambitious Julius II decided to have it demolished and rebuilt beginning in about 1503. In Bramante's design, the original longitudinal basilica plan with its long nave, double side aisles, transept and apse was replaced with a huge centrally planned church in the shape of a cross with equal arms, which is called a Greek cross or an equilateral cross. Um, the structure would then be topped with a huge central dome and smaller domes, which radiated outwards to essentially form a series of perfect circles and squares. Uh, this design really drew inspiration from the Roman pantheon, and the central plan was meant to emphasize the church's function as um, a sort of martyrium for St. Peter's grave, while the circular drum also symbolized the eternal nature of God. However, Bramante died before he was able to see his plans through. Um, after Bramante's death, Raphael was hired to complete his plan, and then later, in about 1546, Michelangelo added to the facade. However, New St. Peter's won't truly be completed until the 17th century. Um, we're going to leave it here for now, but when we discuss um, the Baroque era and uh, the Italian artist Bernini, we will return uh, to the New St. Peter's Basilica.